Rajiv Devi here. He is Maker Ed's Director of Education and Communications. Uh, I'll let you read in your bio his extensive background in science and in education, his time teaching at the Hopeful School in Portland, Oregon. But I just want to share that a few weeks ago, or last month, I had the opportunity to go around the Maker Fair with Steve and get to see making through his eyes. And it was an incredible treat to have that opportunity and I am so, he has never done a workshop here in DC before. So you are the first group to ever get his, uh, his wisdom through a workshop here. He's been all around the country but not here in DC before. So it's a true honor and uh, privilege and it's such an honor to work with him every day. So this is a, a great opportunity I think for the whole room. So welcome Steve. Thank you Rachel. Rachel is the cutest baby in the world, so <laughs> she's, quite the, she's quite the maker herself. <laughs> uh, we had a talk yesterday at the Maker Fair about uh, all things maker ed, and, and community in particular, and kind of ended it with this phrase that I've gotten from another maker educator about what is your maker ed? Because the only way in my mind that maker ed survives and thrives in many different communities as inclusively impossible as possible is if it's very personalized, if it's adaptable, if it's not just one thing, if it's not one curriculum. So I will tell you about what my maker ed is, with the idea that it is not the definitive maker ed, right? It is many, many things. My maker ed is very focused on open-ended inquiry, exploration, and tinkering. It's this invitation to play, and I love inviting play in adults, because I've seen the results of how powerful it is with children. And part of, most of what I want to do, actually, before we start making, to kind of prime the pump here, is to share with you the voices of my students, and to show you, in a few videos, um, both what it's like for a school to have making infused in every subject. Because making is about more than STEAM, it is about humanities and civics and all areas, what we call learning as a whole. Now I'm especially interested in empathy and empowerment. These are the things that I really love to see students take away more than any piece of knowledge. Knowledge happens to come when you feel empowered. Knowledge happens to come when you feel empathy for others because you want to help others. These are the consequences of having making opportunities involved in your education. So I want to have some students of mine that are recorded during the lunchtime conversation share a little bit of a, they're thinking of play and learning in about a two minute video. And the video that you'll see is all the many different subjects they have. And you'll see the excitement that they feel for education when making and the arts are infused in everything that they do. So if we could start that video. Learning is 
So those are my students, um, and that is the excitement. The oh yay, math is coming, science is coming, history is coming, I can't wait. Um, I never get tired of seeing that, and I love putting this video together because you get to see all the stuff that is left on the cutting room floor, um, and all the voices I had to cut out of that conversation, which is a lunchtime conversation, me sticking a microphone in the face of my students, asking them to play and learning. Um, what can you share with adults? How can you inspire them? How can you show them what education can look like? They had some very specific um, advice that I'll show in the next video that if you look at VLC, I think there's a separate um, the audio control that might not be pumped all the way up in VLC is because it's really low. And uh, please don't start this one quite yet. Yeah. Uh, we're talking about material constraints today. My idea of empowerment is helping others to see the possibilities of what you have already. When you begin, you might think you want to have a fab lab, or you might think you want to have a 3D printer. Those are wonderful tools that are fantastic and can be used in so many different ways. But what you already have in a classroom or at a home is the most empowering thing of all things. You have access to it. And not only that, when students build with it and communicate with it, they can take it home and look for things. And more than that, more than what you have access to, it's the mindset you have of how you view the world. So the materials you saw that the students were using there, the electronic parts, were from things they'd salvaged and taken apart. They're helping to, to get materials for me, otherwise I couldn't do it all. They're helping to recycle things or using art materials in different ways. I'm asking all those things of you today. So the boxes that you have on the table right here are common materials you might find in, in most schools, and maybe not in abundance, maybe they have to be recycled or scrounged for or asked for, but they are simple materials, and they're very powerful materials, especially when you allow for the time tinkering and exploration. So regarding tinkering, I wanted my students to share uh, some of their thoughts. This was for Maker Faire a number of years ago when I told them I was going to be sharing their tinkering work and they wanted to be a part of it. So they helped me select these slides to share their work. And all the work that you see here is making infused in every subject in school and their advice for adults about playing and tinkering. So go ahead and roll the video. Thanks. Someone to take over. You kind of have 
have to have a free hand when you take it. There's so many paths you can take on to do things, and if you only take one path, you should just know that there's so many more other things you could make with this object. But there is one thing that teachers and grown-ups and other people don't let you do in Tinker. Make an atomic bomb. But why would you want to make atomic bomb in the first place? <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't mind these students dominating the planet, but not my talk for me is to. Uh, so they are very wedded and used to this tinkering idea, which when I go to conferences and offer workshops, it, it's a new thing for some people, and some people are very comfortable with it, and some people are very uncomfortable with it. Some people love to follow directions and, and everything, and I want to say that that's all right. I want to say that if you love directions and you want what you're doing to be very clear, that's a learning style that is very appropriate for you, and we, that should be offered on the spectrum of choices for children that have all sorts of learning um, you know, needs, but being offered the chance to go with their own ideas, have their own theories, to develop their own things that you can tie to math and science first, so that you have a context to share your knowledge with if you want to, is to, to give a lecture in the context of what they work with. Very important. So in that regard, you have your colleagues around your table, and in, in the name of wanting to spread community and empathy for each other, I'm going to ask for some collaboration, and when I'm asking you to build with these things, I want you to work in groups of two or three build that empathy and that, that conversation, and also to get some support. And if you don't know something like how to connect a motor to a battery to get it going, um, you'll have people look around, you'll have me to ask, I will offer that support if you need it, and you can get it, the expertise shared around the room. Of course, we'd love to share and distribute expertise between teachers and uh, students, so we'd love to do it with teachers as well. So I've um, got a couple provocations up here. If you could go to the next PDF in particular, a prompt that I would give you for what you have materialized here is to develop a variation, um, your own your own design, of the common little squiggle bot, art bot standard that you kind of see. And it's kind of a mission of mine to have those be far more open-ended than you usually see. Um, you might go to a museum and see that they're all built with a strawberry basket, or you might go to that museum and see that they're all based on cups. Or you might go to that museum and it's entirely a spinning kit, um, and the kids build something they don't recognizes their own, it's not personalized, it's not their own design. So there's no set instructions of what I'm asking you to do, but I am providing materials that make it easy to make a large variety of designs. And if you're curious, I've got all sorts of examples up here. This design in this little micro dice happens to use Q-tips instead of markers because they allow for very small designs, very flexible, very inexpensive. And so they end up being basically the cost of the motors and the batteries. So in bulk about $1.50, $2 per robot. Sometimes enough for kids to take home and remake and reuse. Um, so you can see all sorts of little critters and personality that can come out of these, but there's no one set form factor. And in fact, you don't even have to use the Q-tips. Something electromechanical is something I ask for as well. There's also light in the kits and LEDs, so you may use something, whatever is your comfort zone, in your partnership. So micro watercolor art box. Once you get something built, I'll be going around between tables and making sure that you have access to these TSA approved sizes of <laughs> liquid watercolor. You can even use liquid water for this, uh, watercolor for this. You can use food coloring. You can use a palette of actual uh, dry watercolor, kind of rub the Q-tips in it. Many ways to get to this that don't rely on markers makes it less expensive. So I invite you guys to play, help each other out, be inspired. Look at the materials and uh, you may notice a slight variation in the materials I've uh, provided at each table. It's sort of intentional, I guess. Steve, for those who might not be familiar with what an art bot is. Oh, yes. <laughs> the, broad, the broad genre of art bots is, <laughs> is anything electromechanical or not. Uh, anything that kind of creates art for you. And I'm aware that a lot of artists actually sometimes cringe a little bit. Is it art? It's a big philosophy, philosophy question, right? <laughs> is what people, I like to say, make something that is and or makes art and <laughs> whether or not everybody else agrees it's art is part of what art is all about, that discussion about what art is, right? So it's fun, it's engaging, and um, it's what you make of it. So I am always surprised every time I ask this. Every single teacher workshop I do that asks this open-ended, build something that makes art, I get massively different ideas. And sometimes it comes after people sit for five to 10 minutes with no idea what to do. And you let that happen, you let that percolate, you let them look around and get inspired. So there is lots of inspiration here. I saw so much this morning that tells me that this group is going to come up with some spectacular things, and I can't wait to see what that is. So shall we get making? All right. Make something that makes art and or is art.
stable design it's got this motor spinning in the bottom Okay, so I think we're going to pause here with the sharing. 